as a boy and then as a young man, our Lord Jesus Christ was accustomed to all the normal experiences of being the firstborn son in a large family of Jewish boys and Jewish girls. Now, that might shock some of you to realize that our Lord Jesus belonged to a big family, and uh, he had at least six other siblings, and he alone, of course, was virgin-born, and he alone was the only begotten Son of the living God. He is God manifest in the flesh. You all know John 3.16. Well, 1 Timothy 3.16 tells us that he's God in human form. He's God manifest in flesh. And sometimes we sing with reference to him at Christmas, veiled in flesh, the Godhead see, heal incarnate deity. He's the second person in the Trinity, the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. And he's co-equal and co-eternal and co-creative and co-sapient and co-existent with the Father and the Holy Spirit. Don't forget the co-existent. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit all coexist at the one and the same time. Don't let anybody tell you the Father became the Son and the Son became the Spirit and there's only one. No, it's not so. Mary's other children were fathered by Joseph, her husband, during their many years of married life together. And we read, and I'll read it to you now, in Matthew 13, verse 55 to 56. Listen carefully. The people of Nazareth are speaking, and they say, Is not this the carpenter's son? Is not his mother Mary? And his brethren James and Joses and Simon and Judas? And his sisters, are they not all with us? And again in Mark chapter 6 and verse 3, I'll read it to you, don't worry. We read again, Is not this the carpenter, the son of Mary? the brother of James and Joses and of Judah and Simon? And are not his sisters here with us? And they were offended at him. Joseph was well known in Nazareth as the carpenter, and our Savior lived there in Nazareth for over 25 years. Now, I remember saying that in a big, big meeting one night in a mission, and a well-known pastor came to me and he said, uh, George, he says, the Lord Jesus was 30 years old before he launched out into his ministry. I says, I know. But I says, he was, don't forget, he was in Bethlehem. And then the Lord told Joseph to take him away down into Egypt. And then after that, he went up the, via Maris up the sea coast. And when he heard, when Joseph heard that Archelaus did reign in the room of his father Herod, he went on up to Nazareth. So he was there over 25 years. Oh, he says, that's right, I forgot about that. So just in case you forget about that and think I've made a blunder, because you can sit me at that in your mind the whole rest of the meeting so that you can say to me at the end of the meeting, you made a wee mistake there. <laughs> and you could lose the meeting over that. So we have to be careful. He was there for over 25 years, away up there on the top of the mountain at Nazareth. I've been there many, many times. And from that statement in Mark 6 and uh, verse 3, is not this the carpenter, the son of Mary? We would seem to uh, be able to discern that he helped his legal guardian Joseph in the workshop of the family business. And uh, after our Lord Jesus Christ was baptized in Jordan by John the Baptist, you'll remember, and you'll remember what happened. The Holy Spirit came down in the form of a dove, and he was anointed of the Spirit. Now, the Spirit was eternally in him. We've already seen he's God. There never was a time when the Holy Spirit wasn't filling him. But my friend, don't forget that God said, I have put my Spirit upon him in Isaiah. And here we see the anointing of Christ for his ministry. And you'll remember how that the heavens opened and God Almighty spoke and said, This is my beloved Son in whom I'm well pleased. And away he went. He was driven by the Holy Spirit into the wilderness. What for? 
to triumph victoriously over the devil. That's what it's for. I know he defeated the devil on the cross, but he defeated him in the wilderness. And don't forget that. Now, I want you to realize that he went back to Bethabara beyond Jordan, and he called some of his disciples to follow him. And he launched out into his ministry around Judea and was doing that for a year. And sometimes we miss that. Now, I want you to get the excitement of the atmosphere of this in Matthew chapter 4. If you'll now turn, please, and follow me to Matthew chapter 4. Let me just simply say this as uh, one who is among friends tonight. Um, I have prayed and sought God for so long, and he has been speaking to me, and it didn't all come together until uh, last week. And I can assure you that the message that I have, I'm not playing games. I believe it's from God, and I believe God wants to actually speak to someone in this meeting just now, or listening perhaps on the CD or DVD, watching on the DVD. But I believe God's going to speak. I believe that. If I haven't got that, I'll tell you I haven't got anything. But I know I have that. And uh, so I'll be asking you to read a few scriptures because uh, we want you to get God's message, whoever you are. If you never got it, we want you to get it tonight because we know the state you're in. We understand something, whoever you are, of the terrible state that you're in. Okay, we're at Matthew 4 and verse 12, and we read now, when Jesus had heard that John, that's John the Baptist, was cast into prison, he departed into Galilee. And leaving Nazareth, see that? Leaving Nazareth, he came and dwelt in Capernaum. Now that's just uh, uh, 20 miles away uh, from Nazareth. And on the seacoast, it's actually the Lake of Galilee. It's sometimes called the Sea of Galilee. And he dwelt in the borders of Zabulon and Naphtalim. Now, uh, John the Baptist was held in a place called Machiris, a big fortress. And uh, you'll remember how that Herod Antipas eventually beheaded the man, uh, the man of God, and shut the mouth of the prophet. And God never spoke to him again. Even on the crucifixion day of our Lord Jesus Christ, he wouldn't speak to him. Wouldn't. You see, you can shut the mouth of the person that God's using to reach you, and God will never speak to you again. Dangerous stuff to do such a thing. But the Lord Jesus Christ moves from Nazareth, which was uh, in the dominion of Herod Antipas. He, did, he didn't want a boy like that ruling over him. And he went to the nearest place where he could be uh, under the dominion of the Tetrarch Philip. And that's what he's doing here. This is a wonderful, brand new beginning as our Savior launches out into his public ministry, leaving 30 years of obscurity behind him. Now, uh, he made Capernaum his headquarters on the shore of Galilee. Many of you have been there. And it's just 20 miles uh, northeast of Nazareth, just 20 miles away. And uh, he was now outside the domain of Herod Antipas. And our Lord Jesus always took every lawful precaution for physical protection that was available to him. He never taught us to be reckless or foolhardy. Somebody wrote and said, he wasn't afraid. Of course he wasn't afraid. But he took every lawful precaution. If you're a security officer, you make sure that you don't put yourself in a bad position. Even God said when he was a baby, get him away down into Egypt until they that seek his life are dead. He didn't say, leave him where he is, and if they come near him or touch a hair in his head, I'll evaporate them. He could have done that, but he didn't. That's not the way God works. Don't be foolhardy. And uh, in verse 17 there, uh, we read from that time, get these words, Jesus began to preach. Isn't that powerful? Jesus began to preach over the years, the last 44 years and more for John. We have seen young men coming to the Lord Jesus Christ. We have seen them 
uh, starting to pray, and then after a while they'll get up in the morning meeting and they'll share a few thoughts about the Savior. And before long we're asking them, will you, will you speak at the prayer meeting? And then they end up uh, taking all the meetings, and now they're all over the world. We have people all over the world from this fellowship over the last 43 years, pastors and evangelists and missionaries and all the rest of it. They've gone everywhere. And here we can look back in our minds and we can remember them beginning to preach. Here's Christ just beginning to preach. You're getting it, aren't you? And to say, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And you would think that he would have been absolutely worn out after fasting in the wilderness and facing the devil for nearly six weeks. You would have thought he would have needed a long holiday. No, I would. But he had bound the strong man, and now he was eager to plunder him and to set his miserable captives gloriously free in Galilee as well. Look at verse 23 of Matthew 4. And Jesus went about all Galilee teaching in their synagogues. Let me share a wee thing with you. When you go over to Galilee, you'll find that the Jews are digging up archaeological remains of all the synagogues that existed in Jesus' day. But they thought that they had one over in the Christians. You see, no matter where you go in Galilee, there are Christians pouring in because the Lord was at Capernaum and the Lord was in these different places. So when they saw all the, the Christians going to see their archaeological discoveries of all the synagogues around Galilee, they said, what are you doing here? This is Jewish property. These are Jewish archaeological remains. You have nothing to do with this. They said, oh, yes, we have. Our Lord Jesus Christ preached in all the synagogues round about Galilee. So no matter where they're digging them up, you know the Lord preached there. I thought that was funny. But it says here, and preaching the gospel of the kingdom, and listen to these alls, A-L-L, -L, and healing all manner of sickness and all manner of disease among the people. And his fame went throughout all, listen, Syria, we know about Syria, don't we? And they brought unto him all sick people that were taken with various diseases and torments and those that were possessed with devils and those that were lunatic. And notice there's a distinct difference between the two of them, those who are possessed and those who are lunatic. And those that had the palsy, and he healed them. And there followed him, listen to this, there followed him great multitudes of people from Galilee, it's way up in the north. From Decapolis, that's at Galilee on the east shore. And from Jerusalem, 100 miles away. Same distance from Belfast to Dublin. And from Judea and beyond Jordan. I want you to get this here into your hearts. I want you to picture this tremendous scene. And please never forget it. These great multitudes, the Holy Spirit, who inspired this to be written, says. These great multitudes are walking, for many of them, for a hundred miles. And, and they're walking through rugged, dangerous terrain without air-conditioned coaches or buses or cars or modern roads. Can you see the poor and the sick and the blind and the lame and the afflicted people traveling from all over this great expanse, some of them from Syria? Can you visualize in your mind's eye this tremendous scene of biblical proportions? Our precious Savior and Lord Jesus Christ is in the midst of his apostles, surrounded by multitudes of his disciples. And then beyond that, constant waves of poor, lost, broken-down humanity on the scrap heap of life being drawn by the miraculous power of the God-man. It might help you to get a bird's-eye view and look down on this great, vast, spectacular ocean of ordinary people converging seemingly endlessly from the north and the south and the east and the west towards one focal center. They don't want to see anybody else. They want to see him. But seeing him isn't enough. They want to hear him, but hearing him isn't enough. They want to sit in his blessed presence. But even that was not enough. 
every last one of them, in faith, stretching forth their hands and their arms, believing that they've got to actually make contact with the living Lord Jesus Christ. Forty-five years ago, that was my greatest desire. And it remains my greatest desire today to be in contact with the one who created me, to be in contact with my God. And I prayed as an ungodly man, Lord, please show me how to get into contact with you. And hallelujah, he did. If you were in a desert and you were dying with thirst, and then suddenly you discovered a well of water sitting before you, what would you do? Would you sit and admire it? Would you look at the surroundings and paint them? Would you take a stone and check the depth of the well? Would you sit down under the shade of the vegetation around the well? Or would you drink from that thirst-quenching water and be refreshed and satisfied and live if you didn't actually drink from the water in the well? You would die beside it and become bleached bones, just like so many of the animals you see out there in the Judean wilderness. We see our Lord Jesus Christ here in all the vitality and strength and might of his young manhood, moving through the pressing crowd with a dignity that marked him as being distinctively different from everybody else in the human race. His mere presence radiated such an influence that multitudes were irresistibly drawn to his side. Maybe you're saying already in this meeting, oh, how I wish I could go back in time to the days of Jesus and ask him to forgive me and save me and deliver me and meet my personal need. That's the whole point, poor sinner without Christ. He's here right now in this meeting. He has given us his unbreakable promise from his own sinless lips that cannot lie. If he had told one lie, he'd have been a liar. And he would have needed a savior. He would never have been able to be your savior and mine. Can't lie. He says, heaven and earth up there will pass away. He says, not one jot or one tittle, not one full stop or comma will pass away from my word. And he has taught us that where two or three are gathered together in my name, there am I in the midst of them. You say, you boys think you're something special? No. It doesn't matter if you're in a forest or if you're like our brethren that were slaughtered by the Islamists this week. It doesn't matter where you're meeting. If you're meeting in secret in North Korea, if there's two or three gathered together in his name, he's there. He's there. He'll never fail. He'll never lie. He'll never break his promise. But you've got to respond to the gospel message. If you're to experience God's forgiveness for your ungodly sins and the miracle of the new birth, it's no good sitting admiring it or listening about it and all that. That's like the man sitting at the well and dropping dead beside it. No. Hebrews 13 and verse 8 says, Jesus Christ the same yesterday and today and forever. Is that enough for you? I remind you that he had already performed astonishing miracles at Cana of Galilee. And we were thinking about Cana of Galilee just a couple of weeks ago at Naomi and Alistair's wedding. And he had also uh, worked miracles at, at Capernaum. And now he's making a return visit to the familiar ground of the home of his childhood and boyhood and young manhood. If you'll turn with me to Luke chapter 4, please. Luke chapter 4. And we're going to follow this story here in Luke chapter 4 for a moment or two. This is a way that I believe I've been guided to go, and this is the way we must go. Luke chapter 4 and verse 16 you know the story well. And referring to our wonderful Savior, we read, And he came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up. Where were you brought up? I was brought up in East Belfast. 
And I'll tell you, there are civil people. Even if they have a war, they have a civil war. And he came to where he'd been brought up. And as his custom was, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day. That's the Sabbath day is Saturday, the seventh day of the week. It never was anything else, and it never will be anything else. And he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day, and he stood up for to read. He stood up in the congregation to indicate he wanted to read, and then after the reading he would sit down in verse 20, and he would begin to teach. And there was delivered unto him. Now watch how many times we read about the book here. There was delivered unto him the book of the prophet Isaiah. That's just a Greek way of saying the Hebrew name Isaiah. And when he had opened the book, now it wasn't a hardback book, but a sacred scroll, like a small roll of wallpaper with a wooden stick for a handle at each end. And he found the place where it was written, and he's actually at Isaiah 61 and verse 1. Although a scroll has no chapters or verse divisions in it, but our Bible has because they're very handy for looking things up. And he began to read, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty them that are bruised, to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. And he finished at a comma, a comma. And he closed the book. And he gave it again to the attendant keeper of the sacred scrolls in the synagogue, and he sat down. And the eyes of all them that were in the synagogue were fastened on him. And he began to say unto them, This day is this scripture fulfilled in your ears. And all bear him witness and wondered at the gracious words that proceeded out of his mouth. And they said, Is not this Joseph's son? Now he was indeed the stepson of Joseph with regard to his manhood. But as we have already seen, he is in fact the only begotten son of the living God with regard to his godhood. As he arrived at Nazareth that day, he would have been out of breath because, as I've already said, Nazareth is built on top of a mountain. I wonder if you visited a place that brought back memories recently. Or have you been taking a walk down memory lane, looking at old photographs, or thinking about dear friends who are now gone? He would remember running alongside his mother Mary's skirt from a very early age to collect water, just as the children still do in the city of Nazareth today. They hold on to their mommy's skirt so that they don't get lost, you see. And... Uh, that well is fed by the only spring in Nazareth, so you can't get it wrong. He would remember the smell of the wood shavings as he brushed up the floor in Joseph's workshop. Isn't it amazing that the one who created the starry plow in our night sky once made wooden ones for men? Now, the sacred scroll of Isaiah was totally authenticated and vindicated and substantiated and validated by the Son of God himself as being the divinely inspired living and eternal Word of God. There weren't two Isaiahs or four Isaiahs or anything like that. It was Isaiah, and the Lord knew. This day is this scripture fulfilled in your ears. That had been written, that prophecy, 700 years before that day. And our Savior walks into the synagogue that he knows so well, and he reads it from the scroll that he had studied long and hard. As a matter of fact, he was the one who inspired Isaiah to write it. And he says, this day is this scripture fulfilled in your ears. Sometimes I think we miss the fact that as our Savior spent 25 years there at Nazareth, God gave him favor with God and with men as long as he kept his mouth shut and didn't preach to them. He was socially acceptable. But as soon as he began to preach the truth to them, it was a different story. They tried to end his life. He's despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. They had watched him grow up. They knew that his custom was 
to attend the old synagogue at Nazareth. But that day, listen to me carefully now, that day he was coming with a twofold message. And he would emphasize a twofold power source. And it was for a twofold audience. Now, did you get that? Because that's what the Spirit of God has worked into my soul for this meeting tonight. He was coming with a twofold message, and he would emphasize a twofold power source. And it was for a twofold audience. First of all, what was his twofold message? Well, obviously, it began with the message of the gospel for all men. That's what he's telling us here. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he hath anointed me to preach the gospel. And that's what he's doing. He's preaching the gospel. But then he gave a message directly to those believers who were in the synagogue that day. That was different, wasn't it? Let's think of the gospel first then. I want you to notice there's our precious Savior and Redeemer and Lord Jesus Christ as he preaches the gospel message to poor, lost, undone sinners. He doesn't ignore the here and now aspect of it. I know the priority is to save your soul and mine from hell, from the torments of hell. If this night was to see your heart take its final swing and then lie forever still, you would be in hell forever if you're not saved. You can't put this off. You would be mad to put it off. But the Lord didn't ignore the here and now side of the gospel. He came not only to save men and women's souls, but to save their lives. He didn't come to destroy their lives. He come to save them. Sin is like a scorpion with two stings in the tail. One hits you now in this world as you reap what you've sown in the past. But it's no comparison to the full-grown, horrific hell that engulfs our soul with intolerable pain and torments for all eternity. The Lord Jesus said, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he hath anointed me to preach the gospel to who? The poor. There are three different words in the original Greek for poor. And the word that's used here doesn't necessarily mean financially poor. The word here means meek, destitute, oppressed, lowly. It means those who are afflicted by some misfortune or calamity. A humbling of circumstances and of spirit. I wonder, has something crashed into your life? Racked it, destroyed it. You'll never get over it. I could tell you a thousand stories of people that that has happened to. To the beggared, to the poor in spirit, to the meek. Listen, sin is a robber that ravages and strips you naked of everything that God has ever blessed you with. Just like the man on the Jericho road left half dead. It'll strip you of your character. Sin will strip you of your purity, young woman. Your peace, young man. Your health, your sanity, your marriage, your life, your hopes for the future. And eventually it'll rob you of your very soul's salvation and you'll end up in hell instead of heaven. As we heard you praying tonight. You broken hearted? see so many people around us in these days are heartbroken by overwhelming grief. And I've got to watch because I'm, I have my eye on that clock. And there's, there's dozens of them going through my mind just now. Those who have been bereaved. We boy of six died last week. Granda was walking in with them in the farm. Another man of 70, a believer, fell off a wall on another farm. Some of them, they go down into the slurry tank and their sons go down after them. And it was a dog that went down in the first place. And now the mother's in an asylum at times wondering what happened. 
Maybe it's a broken relationship, a broken engagement, a broken marriage, or maybe it's family trouble, I'll tell you this. It's family trouble that takes you to the very limits. Family trouble. Health breakdown, business failure, unemployment, young people can't get work. You can't get work if no money. You can't ever get a car and learn to drive or get married or anything like that. Pray for the young people. Oh, how we need this recession to back up and let people live. God cares about you. I know you may say at times, as Trevor was saying, Trevor said to me last week, you pray for me for the morning meeting and I'll pray for you for the gospel. I'm never praying for him again. He preached my message this morning. I said, I'm never going to pray for you again. But if the Spirit of God's in him and he's preaching to this meeting and the Spirit of God's in me and preaching to the meeting, it must be on the Spirit of God's heart that someone really needs you. The Lord's touched tonight. God cares about you. And he sent his precious son from heaven to be your great heart specialist and fully meet that soul-destroying need. You know what it is. I could go on all night thinking of different things it might be. An inferiority complex can wreck your life. There's a thousand things, my friend. Are you broken-hearted? You can have done with soaking your pillow with tears when the Lord binds up and heals your broken heart. And only our wonderful Savior can do this. No one else in the human race has ever been able to do it. And I'll tell you something else. They're making great strides, the doctors, with physical sicknesses. But do you see the mind? They're as far away as ever, God help them. They're trying to help the people. And it's great to have them there when you need them. But they just don't know. Are you in bondage? Are you bondaged by a thousand fears or worries? Worry nearly killed me. Anxieties, regrets, witchcraft, the occult, evil influences, fortune tellers, fortune telling and astrology, tarot cards. Do you recognize any of these things? Are you chained by habits? Alcohol, drugs, illicit sex, pornography, gambling, glue sniffing, tobacco. He said that he came to preach deliverance to the captives. He can set you free. He gives freedom from the dominion of sin. He breaks the power of cancel sin and sets the prisoner free. How do you know, Bates? Because he set me free. Man, the devil told me for months, Okay, okay, Bates. By some hidden vein of willpower, you've got out. But I get you in again, and when I get you in again, boy, will I teach you a lesson. Running around there preaching. Listen, when Christ opens the door of your prison, the devil can never get you back in there again. Hallelujah. You're free forever. No more slavery. No more bitter bondage from soul-destroying hard taskmasters. Demonic powers. Our Lord Jesus Christ said personally, he guaranteed personally, if the Son therefore shall make you free, you shall be free indeed. Are you blinded? Are you in darkness? You can't see the way ahead for your life. You can't understand why you got such a raw deal in life. You've lost your sense of direction and purpose. You know you can't make it alone. The Savior said that he came to give recovering of sight to the blind. Take him at his word tonight. He'll bring you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Are you bruised? He promised to set at liberty them that are bruised. The opening of the prison to them that are bound. Has the devil had a swipe at you? Is your life on the scrap heap? So was mine. Have you no human hope? Neither had I. I thought I was going eventually into a potted cell and I wouldn't even know who my wife and family were when they would come up to visit me. You've made your bed. You'll have to lie in it. That's what the devil used to tell me. Hallelujah. I'm not lying in it anymore. 
He has opened the prison doors to all that are bound and held captive by the devil in his will. And in the page and passage that our Lord Jesus read, the prophet Isaiah is picturing the year of Jubilee and the release of all the captives from Babylon. And we, friend, tonight are now in the age of grace. That's why we have two young women saved by the grace of God at the barn mission in the meeting. The Savior came to destroy the works of the devil, to become the substitutionary sacrifice and sin bearer for all those who will repent before God and embrace him by faith as our only Savior. Listen, let me say this to you. This is the truth. Behold, now is the accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. And for all of us, whether we're beggared, brokenhearted, bondaged, blinded, bruised, the acceptable year of the Lord, the year of Jubilee, is now. It's the day of God's favor to save you now. And the Savior stopped reading at a comma because it's not the day of God's vengeance yet. He didn't read the rest of the sentence where it says, on the day of vengeance of our God, because it hasn't come yet, but it's about to come. It's coming soon. That comma represents the entire church age in which we're living and have been living for 2,000 years now. Now let me bring you to that that's on my heart tonight. I said that day he was coming with a twofold message. We have seen it was the message of the gospel for all men. And then he gave a message directly to those believers in the synagogue. What was that? Our precious Savior told them that they had responded in unbelief to Elijah and Elisha in their day. And because of that, as a result of that, they couldn't benefit from their miraculous ministry either. You don't believe them, then you can't enjoy the benefits through them. And God passed over his chosen people, and he used the heathen instead. That's what he's telling them. He used a non-Jewish widow, a woman from Sarepta, to look after Elijah during the three and a half years of drought. Why didn't he use a Jewish woman? Because he didn't even believe Elijah and Elisha. And he used a non-Jewish leper when God decided to heal one. There never was one leper healed. Never one. Till the Lord healed them. Let me say this to you. Except for a Syrian. You'll remember how that God passed by all the Jewish lepers, and he decided to heal Naaman the leper, the captain of the Syrian army. That's what the Lord's telling them. He's exposing the crux of their problem. They don't like it. It's the blinding influence of their false pride in their religious heritage. They were insulted. What's he saying? God couldn't find a widow among the Jews. He couldn't find a leper among the Jews to work with. Is that what he's saying? And they got the hold of them. And the Mount of Precipitation, as it's called, the Mount of Casting Forth, witnessed an ugly scene that day as they took our wonderful Savior in their vice-like grip to the top of that pinnacle to throw him over the edge. If you saw it, you wouldn't believe it. It goes straight up like that. You can see the pinnacle. To this day, I remember Brenton Jones and another brother, Clarence, and they raced up it. I couldn't. I just had to stand and watch them. It was too much for me. I can't help wondering how many others were thrown over the edge and killed. Now, make no mistake about it, that it was a miracle that day when we read he passing through the midst of them went his way. In other words, there was a flashing forth of his deity here, proof of his godhood. The dark powers which controlled them couldn't hold him. He just walked through the lot of them because his hour was not yet come. What's the Savior saying to you tonight through this? He's saying, you just don't believe in me, and you just don't believe in my infallible promises, and so therefore you can't receive all the awesome blessings that I have to give you. That's exactly what he was telling them in the synagogue. You can't have forgiveness of sins. You can't have deliverance from hell and the curse of the broken law. You can't have loving fellowship with God as your Father. You can't have, listen to it, everlasting life. Just two words. Means so much. 
You can't have daily guidance. You can't have the supply of all your needs. You can't have a home in heaven. Why? Because you don't believe. That's why. You don't believe Christ. You don't take him at his promises. Listen, this day is this scripture fulfilled in your ears, but has it been fulfilled in your experience? That's the question. The point is this, it can be fulfilled in your personal experience before you get off that seat. If you will simply take the words and promises of Jesus Christ, God's Son, our wonderful Savior and Lord, as the truth and allow them to make you free. You want to know how to be made free? Everybody on the planet, do you want to know how to be made free? Ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. That's what God's Son says. Don't be running looking for something else to make you free. I did it. You're wasting your time. Hypnosis will never make you free. Devil worshippers and fortune tellers will never make that was the twofold message. He began with the message of the gospel for all men, then the message for the people in the synagogue that day. And how did he, how did he emphasize the twofold power source? He emphasized the living and eternal word of God and the spirit of the Lord. That's what he emphasized. And we have got to learn from this, that this is how God works in our lives. Listen, he gathered with the people of the book in verse 16. That was his custom. He received the book. It was delivered unto him. He opened the book, we're told. That's in verse 17 again. He selected a passage in the book. That's verse 17 again. He read specifically from the book in verse 18 and 19. He closed the book. We're even told he closed the book. And in, that's in verse 20. And in verse 18 to 27, he expounded his message from the book. So what is he emphasizing? The book, the word, the living and eternal word of God, friend. This, that's what it is. There's nothing more precious that you can hold in your hand. Nothing eternal like it. Value it. Get it down off the shelf. Read it and reread it. God's Word, the Bible, is the foundation of our faith. So then, faith comes by hearing, hearing by the Word of God. It's our final court of appeal concerning everything that we believe. The Lord Jesus Christ said, The words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. So it's the Word of God and the Holy Spirit of God. Now, if I haven't got the, the Spirit of God's message, then we'll close the meeting and we'll go home. But I believe that I have. The Lord says, the words that I have spoken unto you, no. The words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. He re-speaks his words unto us. And when the scriptures speak, God speaks. Do you think that Peter knows how a man or a woman or a boy or a girl can be born again? If Peter doesn't know, nobody knows. Well, he says this, being born again, not of corruptible seed, not of something that's corruptible, but of incorruptible seed, by the word of God which liveth and abideth forever. So we can see that he emphasized the word and he emphasized the Holy Spirit. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the gospel. And the word of God, if it's going to become living water to the thirsty soul of poor unsaved people and backsliders, it's got to be the Holy Spirit that brings it. Except the Lord build the house, they labor in vain that build it. Without me you can do nothing, Christ says. And the Lord says, my spirit shall not always strive with man. Now, we see the twofold audience. Yes, there were unsaved on the scrap heap of life, and there were believers. Now, you turn with me, if you will, and please, I know that you're here. I don't know who you are but I've got to read this to you. Would you turn with me to Isaiah 41, please? Isaiah 41. And I haven't prepared for what I'm going to say here because I don't want to give myself any liberty. I want to get this finished now as soon as I can. And here we are in Isaiah 41. Now, please, 
If you're just thinking that this is George Bates playing games, then forget about it. Don't even bother reading it. But this is God's word. Verse 25 of Isaiah 41. To whom then will you liken me? Or shall I be equal, saith the Holy One? Do you know anybody equal with God? Lift up your eyes on high. Trevor said that this morning also. He said so many things. God says, look out there at the universe. And behold, who hath created these things that bring out their host by number? He calleth them all by names. Why is God telling us that? Because the only one who can heal your broken heart is the one that knows the name of every planet in the universe. The greatness of his might, for that he is strong in power, and not one faileth. Then he says this, Why sayest thou, O Jacob, and speakest to Israel? Now I know he's talking to the nation, but he's using one man. He's using Jacob's name. That was his old nature name that his mommy and daddy gave him. God gave him a new name, Israel. So we know that Jacob is Israel in the flesh and Israel is Jacob in the spirit. It's a believer. Why are you saying my way is hid from the Lord and my judgment is passed over from my God? Why are you saying that? Now listen, if I was only saying this, I wouldn't even try to emphasize it, but I'm telling you, God wants you to settle it in your mind. He knows when you sat down. He knows when you'll get up. He knows every thought in your head. He knows every word in your tongue. He even knows your imaginations. Don't say God doesn't know. Don't say God isn't conscious of where I am and what I'm now going through after me serving him all my life. Of course God knows. I weep with you. He knows our ways. He knows our wants. He knows our witness. He knows our worries. He knows our wounds. God knows, brother, sister. Get the grip of this. He knows. And if if he could manifest himself in this meeting right now and let you see him, he would tell you, I know. He says, Hast thou not known, hast thou not heard that the everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth, fainteth not, neither is weary? There's no searching of his understanding. No searching of God's understanding. Listen, he giveth. God never stops giving. He's not saying, I can do these things but I'm not going to. I might do them sometimes, but I mightn't do them others. He's saying, I can do them and I will do them. He giveth power to the faint and to them that have no might, he increases strength. God says, my strength is made perfect in weakness. The world says, God helps those that help themselves. God says, I help those who can't help themselves to them that have no might. He increaseth strength. Even the youths, see them big strong fellows down there? I look at them and I must confess I'm envious, I'm jealous. They're strong, they're young, they're full of vitality. I'm born out and finished and ruined and done. But even the youths shall faint and be weary. And the young men shall utterly fall. But they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They they shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. Listen, my friend. It's not waiting for God to catch up when we talk about waiting on the Lord. You go over to Buckingham Palace and there's so many butlers and there's so many whatever they're called, waitresses or whatever they are. And there they are, and they're all waiting on the royal family. That's what we're talking about. What did Elijah say? As the Lord God of Israel liveth before whom I stand, there shall not be dew nor rain these years, but according to my word. It's waiting on the Lord, keeping your heart and your life open to God like you do. They that wait upon the Lord, they'll renew their strength. Do you know that in their old age, eagles, Renew their feathers. Did you know that? 
I think Robert's hair is looking better now than it ever looked before. Since it turned white. Listen, did you ever watch Superman? Superman, I'm not being late, he's walking. And then he hears with his super hearing, there's a criminal robbing a bank. And the next thing he's running and off comes the clothes. And the next thing he's flying. God says it takes more power to do it the other way around. See, when you mount up with eagles, you don't even have to flop your wings. They just get into the hot air current. I watch them over in Israel, and they go up in a vortex, and they just put out their wings like that, and up they go. You'll mount up with wings as eagles. God will be filling your wings. You'll run, and you'll not be weary. I bet you can plod. And that's the hardest bit of all. The daily plod. God says you'll walk and you'll not faint. Now let me say this to you. God has an exchange rate and I've got to just mention it to you at least before you go home. And I want you to turn with me if you will to Isaiah 61 where the Lord Jesus Christ was reading. Here's where Christ was reading. And Isaiah 61 and I'm finished. You have already heard him say, The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me, because the Lord hath anointed me to preach the gospel, and so on. He says in verse 2, To proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord and the day of the vengeance of our God. He didn't read that that day. He stopped at the comma. And then he says, To comfort all that mourn. Listen to me. I believe this is from God. The day, see what it says there at the end of verse 20, in the previous chapter, The days of thy mourning shall be ended. There's a morning believer listening to me, and I'm almost finished. And God says, it's not going to go on forever. And Trevor said the same thing. I'm never going to pray for Trevor preaching again. He left me with nothing. The days of your mourning shall be ended, God says. Now, you say, why you turn to this? Because we all even know about the prophetic comma. But do we all know what else was in the Lord's mind that day when he read in the synagogue? Because the next verse is bound to have been. And it says to appoint unto them that mourn in Zion. You know there's believers down because of cancer, because of ill health, because of problems and troubles. He says, I w- I'm going to appoint unto them that mourn in Zion and give unto them. Here's his exchange rate. Beauty for ashes. Do you see when you have a handful of ashes? It's something burnt out, isn't it? Burnt out. That's me. Burnt out. Stressed out. Reduced the ashes. Well, the Lord says, I'm going to give you beauty in exchange for that. And the oil of joy for mourning. You see oil, it reduces friction. And God knows your mourning. Well, God's going to give you the oil of joy. This is real. And the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness. Let me say this to you. The spirit of heaviness is a ton weight if it's sitting on your shoulders. And I've seen me in the middle of remarkable blessings with the spirit of heaviness like a ton weight sitting on mine. So your joy doesn't come from your circumstances. Your circumstances might be brilliant. You can be running around morning every day. You can be running around oppressed by the devil. Your circumstances don't adjust your joy. It's your communion with God. Now, what is this all about, George? You haven't told us all that you've in your mind? No. You're taking hobby tablets, aren't you? Well, let me tell you something. They won't make you happy. They'll have you walking around like zombies. And there are those that are physically sick and they need a physician. But there is an eternal dimension of your life and only the sacrificially shed blood of the Lamb will undo all the devastation that your sins have done. Listen, I've got to shut up. I believe that God has spoken and he's given you, whoever you are believer, he's just given you beauty for ashes, the oil of joy for your mourning. He has just given you the garment of praise for the spirit of happiness because at Calvary, 
It's the place of the great exchange, and I can't preach any longer. I want to, I can, but you can't accept it now. But Christ had to pay for every benefit on that cross that you and I have ever come into the good of, or can come into the good of. Let's just bow our hearts before the Lord. Instead of a damned soul, you can become a saved soul. Instead of a condemned sinner, you can be forgiven. Instead of a broken heart, you can get a new heart. Instead of a guilty conscience, you can have peace with God. Instead of an insane mind like mine, you can have power and love and of a sound mind. Christ has paid for it all in his own ruby blood and in his suffering at Calvary. Don't you go home the way you came in. Please, I'm sorry for going on for too long, but I had to get this message over to you. Believe it and enter into the blessing of it.